to open your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 4. We're going to study verse 23 through verse 31 this morning. It's really the finer, final section in this, this lengthy story about the lame beggar being healed and its aftermath as the apostles are warned, rebuked, arrested, and then released. This section this morning considers what happens to them after they are released with this warning ringing in their ears. You know, whenever we read God's Word in faith, we're inviting His Spirit to illuminate its truth and to bring conviction to our hearts. We're presenting ourselves under its authority and most importantly, we are listening to the voice of God himself speaking to us through his written word. So let's do that right now. Let's listen to God's voice speaking to us. Verse 23, when they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Lord, bless the preaching of your word. This last week, you may have seen in the news, a United States senator was participating in a panel questioning a nominee for a position in the federal government. During the questioning, the senator referenced a former piece of writing by the nominee in which the nominee had countered the idea that the Muslim faith can be considered connected to Christianity in some way, and in unequivocal terms, he had declared that those belonging to the Muslim faith would be condemned. He wrote this as a Christian. He had attended a Christian college, and that college was embroiled in some controversy over this issue, and he was writing to defend the orthodox position that Jesus and Jesus alone is the way of salvation. The senator found this statement repulsive. He repeatedly challenged the nominee on his belief in writing. He called it Islamophobic to believe that another religion would be condemned. The nominee attempted to explain that he was simply declaring the orthodox Christian doctrine that only through belief in Jesus can someone receive salvation. But his words did not help his case. After repeated questions, the senator declared that he would vote against the nominee for the position. 
Such a person, he thought, should have no place in the government of this country, all because that man held the same belief that I do about heaven and hell and Jesus Christ. He believes, quite simply, in verse 12 of this chapter, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. We've come to an age where the exclusive salvation of Jesus, combined with the truth of God's holy judgment against sinners, is considered dangerous, is considered morally objectionable, and even a reason for position in government, not to mention other areas in business, certainly cultural prominence and influence, should be withheld. They are not merely strange, they are repulsive. They are morally repugnant to consciences out of step with the scriptures. For many of us, this is a new era in our Christian lives. Not so for our brothers and sisters around the world, but for many of us, this is a new thought that a qualified person, simply because of their belief in the exclusivity of Jesus Christ, could be considered dangerous, could be resisted or even rejected from a position in the government, not to mention other areas of life. It's, it's a new idea. And, and our hearts, I think, as the church, need biblical bolstering to face this new era. Our hearts need biblical precedent, if I can put it that way. They, they need a, a, a biblical prototype. What, what happens when you live in an era where simply for affirming what the Bible teaches about Jesus, you are not merely considered different, you are considered dangerous? How do we bolster our souls? Let's put ourselves in that man's position possible to be tempted to simply explain away and to consider it as just a, a nothing but a, a statement that has no relevance on, on life or maybe something that he wouldn't affirm in quite that same way in that same setting. The temptations to equivocate about that truth would be strong. You would have all kinds of arguments going through your head. Think of the good I can do. Think of the moral good I can do in this situation. It's going to be very uncomfortable in this setting to affirm what people listening to me think of as morally repugnant. We need some biblical bolstering. What happens when the church is warned, do not speak anymore in the name of Jesus? What is the church to do in that setting? Well, because God is so good and kind to us and loving, he wrote that exact scenario into the scriptures to inform us precisely what the church should do. So that of the many questions we might have, we don't have to ask the question, what do we do when that happens? It's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be painful. We'll be tested. But we don't have to ask what to do because we are shown what to do. In Acts chapter 4, verse 23 through verse 31. We are shown in the scriptures what to do in that moment. If I was talking to that man, I would say, look, brother, let me encourage you to go read Acts chapter 4. Go read Acts chapter 4. I know this is crushingly disappointing. I don't know if you I don't know a lot about the guy. Maybe you worked your whole life for this moment. I'm sure it's disappointing, but, but, but go read Acts chapter 4. You'll be encouraged. You'll be encouraged. Read Acts chapter 4 because it describes this scenario. The Lord, Acts chapter 4 says, the Lord will advance his gospel through the dependent faith of his church. The Lord will advance his gospel through the dependent faith of his church. I want to break up this message into two sections, and I, I, I hope you'll see where these sections come from. I wanted to make a quick point this morning. Uh, exegetical preaching, preaching from the word, is, is done, first of all, because we believe the word has power, but it's also done to help us read our Bibles at home. So when we do the, the main points, Aaron and I, Bart, and so forth, uh, we're, we're not just sort of uh, picking points that we think would be nice to say in relation to this passage. We're, we're deriving them from what the passage itself does. 
So if you look down at the passage, this passage, in my view, it breaks into basically two sections, one longer and one shorter. First, the believers are praying, and then God is responding. So there's the, the prayer section, verse 23 through verse 30. They pray, and then verse 31 is the response. So this, this passage, I think, breaks down into two sections. The, the praying church is what I would say first, the praying church, and then the responding Savior. The praying church and the responding Savior. So let's look at this moment of prayer uh, that the believers offer, beginning in verse 23. A number of points we can make. First of all, we want to remember the context of this prayer. The same high priest who had condemned Jesus to death had just stood in front of Peter and John and told them, don't you dare tell anyone else what you're telling us about Jesus Christ. Don't you dare do it. And remember, it's the same people who had ushered Jesus in chains to Pilate to have him executed. Now, in that moment, Peter and John respond boldly and courageously and say, we don't have any choice but to obey God and not you. We will continue to preach. But of course, it's one thing to say that in the moment. It's another thing to let the reality of that threat seep into your bones and to go back to your church gathering and to look at the little children sitting there and start to wonder what would life be like if daddy can't be at home anymore because he's in prison. And that threat would start to seep in the reality of it, the reality that they're going to be cut off from the leadership of their nation. They're going to be cut off from fellowship at the temple. They're going to be cut off from their experience of unity with their fellow Jewish uh, brethren and, and sisters and their fathers, perhaps, and mothers. And the, the prediction of Jesus that even families will be torn apart by this message becomes very real for them in that moment. That's the context of their prayer. We need to feel the drama of the scriptures because if we don't, we won't relate to these believers. We'll think of this as kind of an exceptional thing. We'll imagine perhaps that they already knew in advance what would happen in verse 31, but they didn't, just like we don't. They didn't know what would happen in verse 31. They didn't know what would happen the rest of the chapter. This is the beginning of the church. They don't know the end of the story. They don't know that Paul travels around the whole Mediterranean world and churches are planted and Rome itself seems to give some legal deference to this community for a season. They don't know any of those victories. All they know is that the only nation they've ever known, the only leaders of that nation they've ever known, just told them, don't you dare Teach again in this name. That's the context of their prayer. Moment of testing for the young church. Context of the prayer, first point. Second, the unity of their prayer. We want to notice that when they heard it in verse 24, they lifted their voices together and then said. Notice the unity. Before we even get into the prayer, these are just helpful points. The church gathers together in the face of this threat. In the face of persecution, the church is together. They gathered together. They prayed together. Very important to appreciate. The church is not intended to face persecution as a scattered number of individuals. They're intended to face persecution as a gathering of those who are unified unified in their belief in the gospel, their support of each other, and their longing to see the gospel go forward. They are a united family of sufferers, not merely individuals. Brothers and sisters, this is the same today. We must be unified together because it's in our unity that we face this kind of persecution. No, Peter and John, you will not face this alone. Notice the church doesn't slink away from them. The former friends, they don't ask questions like, well, did you really have to be that bold? Couldn't you have been more tactful? Is this really the moment for boldness? We're just getting started. We're vulnerable. We're fragile. Let's get ourselves. We just got these 3,000 people saved in Pentecost. Let's, let's gain some, some stability and momentum. Can't you have been a little more tactful, a little more strategic? Peter, did you really have to say it that way? Did you really have to bring up that they crucified Jesus? I mean, did you really have to put them on trial the way you did? Couldn't you have been a bit more respectful, mediating, moderating? But no, they don't ask those kind of questions because they're with them. We are with you. This is, a, uh, this is an us problem, they're saying. And so we will pray together. There's a unity in their prayer, very valuable for us to see. 
Third thing about the praying church to point out, notice the confidence of their prayer, the confidence with which their prayer begins. Sovereign Lord, they begin. Sovereign Lord. Sovereign means he is absolutely in control. He is the king of absolute dominion over all things. And to make that explicitly clear, they say, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Notice the confidence that their prayer begins with. What, what does the praying church look like? Again, remember, this is a guide to us. What happens when the church faces the threat of persecution? What will they pray? They pray together, and they pray with confidence. This is a quote almost directly from Psalm 146, in which God's people are facing difficulty, and they turn to the Lord for protection and aid. It's worth noting how often the early church quotes the scriptures. I mean, they are just Bible-saturated people. You can't challenge them. You can't ask them anything and without them turning to the scriptures to point out how they describe and define and guide God's people. And we have even more scriptures, even clearer scriptures than they did about Jesus. But you want to notice this. They turn to the scriptures, and the scriptures give them confidence that God's people in the past had trusted a sovereign Lord in the face of suffering and that he would guard and protect them. So they start there. Sovereign Lord who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Ultimately, Prayers trust in God's sovereign power. Ultimately, that's what prayers are declaring. God, you do what only you can do. You do what only you can do. That's the basis of our prayer. We're not sending hopeful petitions to a God that we hope has the power. We're sending confident declarations to a God we know has the power. Notice the confidence of this prayer. Then we get into the body of the prayer. It just keeps getting better and better. I want, I want to point out the theology. The theology, that the body of the prayer is, is basically broken up into theology and then a request, okay? Theology and then a request. They start with theology. Verse 25, through the mouth of our father David, your servant, you said by the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a lot of theology in there, but part of which is that when we read the Bible, we have confidence that God is speaking, though he spoke through the pens of fallible men. The doctrine of Scripture is basically contained in verse 25. If you're looking for a verse that talks about the doctrine of Scripture, very helpful verse, Acts 4.25. Men wrote, but they wrote what God wanted them to write. Doctrine of Scripture. Men wrote... But they wrote what God wanted to the right. When the Holy Spirit is read, God is speaking. Verse 25. And we can't go into that. It could be a whole message. Verse 25. When, when, when we read the Bible, God is speaking. The, David wrote it. Yes, but God was writing it. And what did he write? Psalm 2. Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Now, this theology is uh, packed. We could do a series on this. Let me just try to summarize a number of points on the theology of this prayer. First of all, it's that God planned the whole thing. Okay? They see in Psalm 2 an outline of what was going to happen to Jesus, and they say that was intentional. They're saying, God, you outlined ahead of time what was going to happen to Jesus. So God's sovereignty over the suffering of Christ is seen by the apostles as being described in Psalm 2, which describes the Gentile nations gathering around the anointed king of God and attempting to dethrone him. But Psalm 2 declares they will not be able to do it. Actually, he will be victorious over them. He will crush the nations with a rod of iron, and only those who take refuge in him will be saved. They say, that's, that's exactly what happened to Jesus. And God, you predicted it ahead of time. For truly, they say, in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus. Here's the nations, Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles, and even the peoples of Israel turned against the anointed one. So they see in the scriptures... A Christ prediction. Very helpful in our understanding of the Old Testament scriptures. The apostles see the scriptures as anticipating Jesus Christ. Great point for biblical theology. 
the apostles read the Old Testament scriptures as intending to anticipate Jesus Christ. We should do the same. This is a very helpful key. They read the Psalms. They read Psalm 2 as intentionally anticipating Jesus Christ. So the Old Testament is a marvelous gospel-centric book, according to Peter and John. Wonderful point to, to reference. But let me, let me say this. Perhaps it struck you that this is a marvelous theology, but sort of an odd theology to begin this prayer with. Did that strike you at all? It struck me. We're facing threats. What are we going to pray? Sovereign Lord. Okay, that makes sense. You would think, you would think the prayer, wouldn't you? You would think the prayer would go right from, notice this, look down at your Bibles, right from verse 24 to verse 29, wouldn't you? Wouldn't that prayer make a lot of sense to you? Wouldn't that something you could pray? Sovereign Lord, you made the sea, the earth, heaven, everything in them. Look upon their threats and grant to your servants to speak with boldness. Wouldn't that be like a really logical prayer? You're sovereign, Lord. Help us. We always want to notice when the Bible has a surprising interruption. Often it's the case that the surprising, apparently illogical interruption introduces the main point we're supposed to get. Often it's the case. And if you can read a prayer like this, and if you were writing it, it would have made a lot of sense just to go from, your sovereign, please help us. And you're wondering, okay, I mean, really cool stuff about Psalm 2 and David and Jesus, but what does this have to do with our suffering right now? The Sanhedrin just threatened us. Here's the crucial point. The apostles are quoting this because they see in the suffering of Christ the paradigm for his body's suffering as well. The apostles see in the suffering of Jesus the paradigm, a, a continuation of the suffering of Jesus as well. That's why they quote this. They're saying, look, the, the, this, what's happening right now, it's just a continuation of Psalm 2. The opposition to Jesus hasn't stopped. It's just continuing towards Jesus' representatives on earth. And that's crucial because it's precisely our identity in the gospel that gives us confidence to pray to you when we face threats and suffering for bearing witness to the Messiah. It's precisely what God has done in Jesus and God's victory through Jesus over this opposition that gives us confidence that as we share and proclaim his name, we will have the victory as well. It is this gospel connection that makes all the difference in our confidence for our own suffering. It's because we're identified with Jesus that we will suffer, but it's also because we identify with Jesus that we will enjoy the victory that God has promised him. See the connection? See all the difference that makes? This isn't just kind of, I'm suffering and there's a God out there that cares about me. It's, I'm suffering because I'm a part of something that God is doing in Jesus. And that's, in one sense, tr sobering because the world hates Jesus, but it's also comforting because the anointed one will receive God's victory and only those who take refuge in him will be protected in the end. Notice the gospel connection here. I mean, this is a wonderful point to make for our own prayers. Make the gospel connection in your own prayers. Sometimes we, we get in the habit of, of relating to God as if there wasn't a work of Christ. He, he kind of got us in, and now we just relate to God kind of directly and without reference to Jesus. That's not what the apostles did. That's not the way Paul writes his letters. It's not the way any of the apostles write their letters. They're constantly connecting our experience to the truth of our identity in Jesus. That's exactly what they do here. Do you see the difference? Because of who Jesus is, we interpret our experience this way. Because of what faced Jesus, since we are in Christ, we interpret our experience this way. Because of what the Gentiles did against Jesus, we would expect that they will do it against us because we are in Jesus, and that gives us confidence for the future. Do you see the gospel connection there? Marvelous biblical theology that they're, they're providing here. David Peterson helps with this point. He says, the apostles imply that what they have just experienced is a continuation, listen to this, is a continuation of the opposition experienced by Jesus himself. The petitions that follow ask God to allow the work of testifying to Jesus to continue. 
unimpeded by the threats of the authorities. Remarkable. They, they imply, he says, that what is happening is just a continuation of what happened to Jesus. That's why they quote Psalm 2 right here. That's the difference between a sort of monotheistic uh, a view of God. He's out there. He watches over genuine faithful believers and a Christ-centric view of God that views all of history as culminating and centering on the person and work of Jesus Christ. That's what gives the church confidence and peace that they will suffer, but God will preserve them in their suffering and the gospel will go forward in spite of all opposition because the cross, though it's not repeatable, is the paradigm for the church when they face the suffering that they will face in this world. So no, we don't die for anybody's sins, but we do share in the opposition that Jesus faced because we belong to him. That's what they're saying. The theology of their prayer. The rejection of Christ leading to his ultimate triumph is crucial to the church's understanding of its own experience. Since the church is united to Christ and is his chosen witness of the message of the cross, the pattern of rejection and triumph will be reflected in the church over the centuries. The difference, of course, is that we will not face God's rejection as Christ did for us, and we will not face this experience alone as Christ did for us. But rather, we will walk through this journey with our Savior, with us, through his Spirit. The world that gathered to reject the Christ gathers still to reject those who bear his name. They're identifying the eternal purposes of God in Jesus Christ and they're finding their own place in that story. Finally, the courage of their prayer. Notice what they pray. Because it's all about Jesus, because God is doing something in him that is more important than anything else, here's what they pray. Now, Lord, look upon their threats be aware of this, Lord. Be aware of what's going on. We know you are, but be aware of it, Lord. And grant to your servants what? To continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Because of their identity in the gospel, what do they want? They want boldness to represent the gospel. Because of their identify with a crucified and risen Messiah, what do they want? Boldness to see God move through the message of the Messiah. What do they want? They want a chance to be courageous, which they are not like naturally. They want a chance to be faith-filled, which they are not like naturally. They want a, faith, a chance to see God do what only he can do through their weak vessels because they identify with Jesus Christ. Give us boldness, they say. Help us to be truthful, Lord. Help us to be bold. Give us boldness and, Lord, and reveal your supernatural power to give affirmation to your word. Do it again, Lord. Bind them again through the irrefutable evidence of your power. What you just did to the Sanhedrin, do it again. Make it indefensible to deny that Jesus is at work in your church. That's the way the early church prayed. Important to notice that looking on their threats is the only reference we have at all to some hope for physical protection. Their, their emphasis, not that it's wrong to pray for protection or release from prison or, Lord, please don't let them martyr this person. That's, that's a good thing to pray for. Justice is always, injustice is always wrong, always good for the church to pray for the protection of the church. However, their heartbeat is for the advance of the gospel, not for their own comfort. Their, their passion, their zeal, what they want God to do is to showcase his power and to give them courage to represent this anointed one while the nations still gather around in hopes of dethroning him. That's what they want. Here's the question for us. Are we praying like this? Are we praying like this? 
That's a scary prayer to pray. Isn't it a scary prayer to pray? Are we praying like this? Are you praying for God to give you boldness even in the face of danger and suffering and persecution and the loss of comfort and the loss of freedom? Are we praying for this? I've talked to so many Christians recently. We think about our country and some of the changes and sort of the boldness of anger at Christian positions that have been upheld for thousands of years and have been comfortable in this country for hundreds of years, that now there's an opposition against them. I've talked to so many people, and, and often the temptation is to, to, to crave a sort of physical comfort or to be outraged that there isn't physical protection for those rights. Even, even this week when I was reading about that exchange with the senator and so forth, I was struck by how frequently the, the response is to go first to constitutional rights and to, to spend a lot of time there. And I'm not opposed to that. I'm, I'm all for constitutional rights. But <laughs> Christians should find great comfort in Acts chapter 4 and the rest of Acts that our, our heartbeat is not to avoid suffering, but to see the gospel go forward. We don't want suffering, but we want the gospel to go forward, and we're more longing for that than we are for the avoidance of suffering. Are we asking for boldness in the face of suffering? Let's exchange our fear for dependent faith. God will work through the dependent faith of his people for the advance of his gospel. We cannot ask for boldness in suffering if avoiding suffering is more important to us than the advance of the gospel. Repeat that same question that I asked last week. Is avoiding suffering more important to us than the advance of the gospel? Brothers and sisters, one of the great leverages the enemy has on the church is the presence of unaddressed fear. Fear that lingers in the heart, craving for a certain style of life and comfort, it's rarely addressed, rarely identified. But brothers and sisters, the little moments of our heart point towards a trajectory. What do we want most? Let me, let me ask a, a question that I, I, is good for my heart frequently. What was I wanting most in that situation? Was I wanting Jesus to be glorified most? Or was I wanting my own comfort or my own authority or the respect that I think I deserve? I remember having a friend who was a wonderful father, and he had trained his children, which is dangerous if you train your children to think biblically. It's a dangerous thing. But he had trained his children, and he was correcting one of his sons, and I guess maybe he was being, uh, you know, somewhat impatient in his correction. He's correcting one of his sons, and at some point the son just responds apparently very respectfully and says, Daddy, do you want me to obey more than you want to glorify Jesus? <laughs> it's a good question. Do I want my children to obey more than I want to glorify Jesus? Definitely, sometimes. We can ask that question through all of life. Do, do, I, do I want to make it to work on time more than I want to represent Jesus in the way that I drive? Do, do I want to represent Jesus towards my spouse more than I want her to respect and honor me? Do, do I want my children to see Jesus Christ glorified as Savior more than I want to protect my reputation in front of them? Yeah. Think about the, the nuances of, of that question just, just goes broad. But here, here's the point I want to make. Look, if, if we're not constantly examining the idol of self-comfort, then when a moment of testing for boldness comes, it will be very difficult for us to pray this prayer. But if we're constantly going to the idol and saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, that was about you. That wasn't about loving your wife, serving your children, honoring the Lord. That was about you right there. 
That was you thumping your chest, standing up, saying, you're not acknowledging me and my greatness. And we need to be convicted and repent of those little moments because those little moments help us to be more about the gospel than we are about ourselves. And if we're not more about the gospel in little moments, we're never going to be more about the gospel when real suffering comes. The church prepares for real suffering by identifying selfishness in everyday life. The church prepares for real suffering by identifying selfishness in everyday life, nailing it to the cross of Christ and saying, for you alone, Lord, do I live my life. I don't live for my comfort and my reputation. That kind of Christian is able to pray, look on their threats, but here's what we want. Give us boldness for the advancement of your gospel, no matter what they do to us. One of my favorite quotes about preaching, and it applies to any kind of Christian, not just preachers, It's from Richard Wormbrand, a Romanian Christian who was tortured for his faith. I I love the, only the gospel could create, could turn this joke that he basically tells at the end of this passage. He says this, it was strictly forbidden to preach to other prisoners. It was understood that whoever was caught doing this received a severe beating. A number of us decided to pay the price for the privilege of preaching. So we accepted their terms. It was a deal. We preached, and they beat us. We were happy preaching. They were happy beating us. So everyone was happy. (laughs) I mean, you chuckle, but you're like, okay, Lord. I want that kind of joy. That kind of joy is found by saying, I count all things as loss, but for the sake of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish for the sake of knowing Christ and being found in him and being like him in his suffering so that by all means possible, I may see him in the resurrection of the dead. For me, Paul says, to live is Christ and to die is gain. So whether I live or die, it's all about him. Little moments of crucifying selfishness Help us to make the gospel more important than our own suffering. It communicates a trust that Jesus Christ will be victorious, and we want our lives to be about him. Okay, quickly, the responding God. The responding God. They pray this prayer, but the climax of the story is not ultimately their example. (laughs) Peter and Paul and John are not the heroes in Acts. God is. They could pray and nothing could happen. They have no strength to resist the power of the authorities. Without God's spirit in them, they had been trembling, weak, cowards. Only by God's spirit are they brave and courageous and self-sacrificing lion men for the Lord. So who's the hero in the story? Well, it's the one who can take cowards and turn them into courageous warriors for Jesus Christ. It's the one who can take people craving and idolizing their comfort and drinking it all in and turn them into people who say, give us boldness. Who's the hero of that story? Well, he reveals himself again in verse 31. When they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered was shaken, it says. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Notice the three things. The place they were gathered together in was shaken. I mean, imagine that. The very room itself is shaken as they pray this prayer. God says to them physically, I am present with you. Who's stronger? The one who can shake the very foundations of this room or the empty threats of people who are trying to oppose God's Messiah? That's what this is saying. God can shake the earth. Don't be afraid of men. Let God shake you. Notice how God responds. The end of this long story, remember I I, I pointed out last week, this lame beggar takes up a significant portion of the book of Acts. There's two whole chapters basically on this one story. Over uh, roughly 30 years of history, two whole chapters is focused on a 24-hour period. Luke clearly thinks this is a big deal. 
And so he zeroes in. He says, look what God did when the church was willing to pray with dependent faith. Look what God did. Well, he shakes the very room to declare he's present. He fills all of them with his Holy Spirit. Now, that's an important point to make. This is not a second Pentecost. The Holy Spirit was within the believers before they were filled with the Holy Spirit. So it's important to point out, this is one passage I would point to and say, the church needs continual fillings of the Holy Spirit. It. These, these, this is a guy that just preached and 3,000 were saved, but he needs to be freshly filled with the Spirit, a fresh experience of the Spirit of God. And the church needs that today. If, if, if you're like, if I grew, if you grew up like I did, in a, a sort of a charismatic church, and there's moments back then that were like, wow, God was just so evidently moving, and that was just amazing. And, but it's maybe been a lot of years since you encountered in, in a, an emotional, powerful way, God is with me right now. I, I just sense his presence. Cry out for that. Pray for that. Or if you're a Christian and you're not sure what in the world this would feel like, cry out for God to reveal himself to you in a profoundly personal way, to fill you with the Spirit. It's not, it's not a spooky experience. It's just experiencing God doing what God does, glorifying himself, making you long for righteousness, making you hate sin, making you want to preach, want to love, want to serve, long for heaven. It's God doing what God does, but in a more profound and powerful way. That's what Phil of the Spirit does. Amen. And even Peter apparently needs to be refilled with the Spirit. He didn't lose the Spirit. The Spirit was still present, active, moving. But this new opportunity brings God in a fresh and profound way among them. And what's the result? Notice, notice God's, God is the greatest writer in the world. Okay? Nobody has anything on the literary genius of God. We've been two chapters in the story, okay? Two whole chapters. Notice the final sentence in the story. What's the final sentence? So at the end of the day, you know that phrase, the end of the day? Kind of means like, okay, a lot, of, a lot of things happened. Strange, weird, uncomfortable, good, bad. At the end of the day, give me the bottom line. Give me the bottom line, Luke. What's the bottom line? They continue to speak the word of God with boldness. What's the bottom line? You'll see these kind of phrases throughout Luke. Luke punctuates his stories, his narrative, with these kind of phrases. They're like bottom line phrases, okay? What happened? They continued to speak the word of God with boldness. They were arrested. They were dragged out of the temple. They were threatened. The lame man was healed. Okay, but at the end of the day, when you count it all up, what happened? The word of the gospel went forward. That's the point. The Lord will advance his gospel through the dependent faith of his church. The Lord will. This is how we read narratives. Okay, what, what does God do? Somehow, this church, uneducated, no experience, no background, no cultural prestige. In danger. What are they doing? Declaring. Jesus Christ. There is salvation in no other name. For there is no one else given under heaven by which we may be saved. But if you confess and believe in him, you will be saved. And you will be reconciled to God. And you will know God as your father. And you will have the hope of heaven. Your sins will be forgiven. And they kept saying that and saying that and saying that to each other. And despite the greatest attempts of the most powerful leaders in their nation, what's the result of all of their threats? They're more bold and more filled with the spirit than than they were the day before. Now it's not just Peter filled with the Spirit. Now it's all of them. You notice that point? Peter was filled with the Spirit yesterday. Now who's filled with the Spirit? All of them. This happens again and again in the book of Acts. The very thing the enemy tries to do to hurt the church helps the church. The very thing he tries to do to crush the gospel spreads the gospel. Now we got a real problem. Now we got, how many were there? I don't know, 3,000? Now, now we got 3,000 Peters. This is bad news. It, it, it'd be like, in, in a negative way, seeing a little ant on top of an anthill and thinking you're going to do away with that ant. So you step on it. 
Then what happens? Except in this sense, it's the gospel. Oh, Peter, stop it. Oh, now we got a problem. Now we've got a problem. Because now, now they're all filled with the Spirit and continue to speak of the Word of God with boldness. What's the point of this? Well, I, I tried to put my finger in the dike of the gospel flood, but doing that made the whole wall fall down. Here's the point for the enemies of the gospel. Stay home. It, it, it will be better. You'll do better if you stay home. But they don't stay home because they're blind and they're foolish. And so they keep coming and they keep attacking and they keep threatening. And what happens? More dikes break. More people go. The gospel spreads. That's the point of Acts. God will. He will advance his gospel. Now, there's something for us to do. What is it? Cry out to the Lord with a gospel-centered longing and faith and willingness and to live lives that say the gospel is more important than our comfort. The gospel is more important than our well-being. The gospel is more important than our prestige. It's more important than certain positions of political power. It's more important than our stamina or our, our cultural status. No, the gospel is more important. And we say that to God. You know what God does? He fills them with the Spirit and the gospel advances. It advances in individual hearts. It advances in homes towards children. It advances in the workplace. It advances in schools. It advances in the community. It advances around the world. The Lord will advance his gospel. Peter and John, the early church, were not angels. <laughs> they were just men and women like you and me. They prayed. God answered. The gospel went forward. Let's pray. Lord, I pray this for myself and for this church that you, Lord, would grant to your servants boldness. And Lord, would you stretch out your hand to heal and do signs and wonders among us and give affirmation to your gospel message. Would you reveal your unlimited power within this church? Lord, would the sick be raised up? Would the dead be raised? Would the hard-hearted be broken by the truth of Jesus? Lord, would the plateauing Christian experience a filling of your spirit? Lord, would the discouraged Christian experience the joy of the Lord as their strength? Would the hopeless Christian experience the hope with their eyes fixed on you as the exalted King? Lord Jesus, would you move mightily and powerfully in individuals in this church? Would you use us? Would you grant opportunity and give us boldness, Lord, to speak your word without fear? Urge us, Lord, of any idolatry of comfort or pride or self-focus. Cause us to say with Paul, for me to live is Christ. We thank you for this privilege and we anticipate your victory your glory when every eye will see you and every knee will be made to bow before you and your perfect wisdom will be displayed for what it is we exalt in you receive our worship and our prayer and please lord respond to it we ask in jesus name amen